Hi everyone, welcome back. This is a recap of lecture three on our ACCA F9 course. Remember that you can go to our website if you want to download the PDF of this or any of our mind maps for free or to purchase the full course should you wish. So the finance sources lecture looked at first of all the criteria for selecting the type of finance the business requires. So we need to finance our investments in some form. So how are we gonna decide how to do that? Remember, we have two choices. We have debt or we have equity. So the first of the criteria will be the cost. Remember, we said that this was the return that you need to pay to investors. So if it's debt, you'll need to pay them interest. If it's equity, you'll need to give them dividends. So it's interest or dividends. And that will be determined by the creditor hierarchy, which we'll talk about in later lectures. It also depends on the duration. Remember we said about matching, about matching our short-term debt with short-term assets and our long-term debt with long-term assets. So we might think about the duration when we're looking at what sources of finance to use. We'll also think about security. Can we put any assets up as security? We'll also consider our gearing ratios, the ratio of debt to equity that we looked at in lecture two. We'll also think about the financial risk that that will leave the firm with. Lastly then, we'll think about availability. Can we actually raise the debt that we want to, or is it simply un unavailable at this time? So those were the criteria that we looked at. First of all then, let's look at equity, shares. We need to understand the capital or stock markets. Remember their function is twofold. The primary function was to enable the company to raise capital but it also enables investors to buy equity. So that's the primary function. The secondary function we said, well, that enables the shareholders to sell. Remember, maybe they've set the business up very early. They've uh, run it for a few years and maybe they want to realize that investment. So it'll enable those shareholders to sell their shares. It also enables us to assess company performance over a number of years. We went on then to look at the advantages of listing on the capitals or stock market. The first of all, we looked at the advantage to the company. What advantages are there to the company of listing? Well, we said that they would have a better standing. It would look better for them. They could also issue equity to raise funds. That would be easier. And it can also lower their cost of equity. The cost to them will be the dividends that they have to pay. But by being listed, they're seen as being less risky and therefore the cost or the dividends that they have to pay may be lower. What about for the shareholder? Well, the advantage of the company being listed from the point of view of the shareholder is that they can sell their shares more easily. Also, marketability will enable them to get more value for them. So by being more marketable, by there being a ready market, there's value in the shares and therefore they'll also be easy to value. There are, however, some disadvantages to the company of listing, and those will include, first of all, the cost of doing that. Remember, we talked about those costs and how high they were. And also the cost of compliance was high as well. You'll also dilute your control, so you'll be bringing other shareholders into the business, so you'll not have as much control as previously. And lastly, there will be public scrutiny of the share once it's listed. We talked then about methods to raise equity. Several methods. First of all, we had a rights issue. Remember, a rights issue is the right to buy shares in the same proportion as your current holding. For example, a one for four rights issue. That means that for every four shares that you own, you can buy one in the new rights issue. Why might the company issue under a rights issue? Well, it's a low cost method and there's no cost or no, no change in the ownership of the business. So that's why you might use a rights issue. We also talked about an IPO, an initial public offering or offer for sale at a fixed price. But then we said, well, it's very costly to do this and you will have the underwriting costs as well. All of that means it's very expensive. The same goes for an IPO at a tender. You might not get 
the amount that you wanted under a tender agreement as well. Lastly, we talked about a placing and we said this is being placed with institutional investors. So going to big investors in the market and saying to them, this is our company. We want to issue shares. Will you be interested in buying a bulk amount of those shares? Why might we do that? Well, first of all, it's cheaper than an IPO. And secondly, you don't have as many investors to deal with. You've got just a few of those large institutional investors. Those were some of the methods, though. Go back and make sure that you understand those if you have any problems. The rights issues. Well, we talked about the uncertainty with the rights issue. That means that we're going to have a diluted EPS because there's going to be more shares. The EPS is going to be diluted. Also, it raises a question about future profits. Why do we need to do a rights issue? Will there be the future profits there? Also, future dividends. Remember, the dividends again will be split across more shares. That causes uncertainty. All of that uncertainty leads to a lower share price. That lower share price is called the theoretical X rights price. And we did several illustrations on the theoretical X rights price. Make sure, go back, make sure that you know how to calculate it. It's very important. The shareholders' options, remember, under a rights issue, they can either exercise the rights, they can sell the rights, they can sell part of the rights, or they can do nothing. Usually if they do nothing, the company will sell the rights for them and give them the money. That was equity issue then. What about debt? Well, we'll talk in great detail about debt later on. At this stage, just understand that there are some different types of debt. Uh, when it comes to security, you might have fixed security over specific business assets or floating security over non-specific business assets. There may also be covenants in debt, particularly bank debt, such as dividend restrictions or ratio restrictions, or maybe even debt restrictions. Types of debt, well, you can have your simple bank finance, or you can have issued debt, which we look at in great, great detail throughout the course. Types of issued debt are debentures, bonds, or maybe even convertible debt. Debt's always issued in units of 100. 100 is the nominal value and interest is always paid on the nominal value. Again, we'll come back to that in greater detail later. One other area that we need to understand is the treasury function. The role of the treasury function is to achieve those financial objectives that we talked about in lecture one. They'll also manage liquidity. Again, we'll talk about liquidity in our working capital lecture in lecture five. They'll also determine the funding requirements. So what sources of finance will they use? And also they'll manage the currency risk. Again, we'll talk about that in detail in lecture 22. The question here is whether to centralize your treasury function. Should you have a central treasury function or maybe have a function in each of your divisions? Well, on the pro side of centralization, you can deal with more volume if you have a centralized function. You can also bulk borrow and also reduce your foreign exchange risk by having expertise within the business. On the other side, well, you won't have local control over your liquidity, for example. It also leads to bureaucracy and it may just simply be impractical to have a central treasury function. So know the differences between your treasury function and your accountancy function. So that was our lecture three on finance sources. Remember, you can download the mind map for free at our website.